And we welcome you to episode 18 of the second season of the Exit Philosophy Podcast. After a week away, I'm Scott MacArthur back in the saddle along with Rich Griffin. And we always like to time check this. And I thought I knew what the date was. And I'm turns out I was correct as I checked my phone. But I, I always check my phone, Griff, because the number of times I've gotten it wrong, not good. We are speaking early in the afternoon on Monday May the 6th, the Blue Jays are coming off a series in Washington in which they lost two out of three to the Nationals. May the 6th, today is an off day, and then they've got a two-game set in Philadelphia this week, tomorrow and Wednesday, another off day Thursday before returning home to play the Minnesota Twins. Uh, Time check for Toronto sports fans is that uh, we are recording this the afternoon of locker cleanout for the Maple Leafs. Oof. (laughs) <laughs> Jeez, you know, we can talk just... about that. We can talk about that shortly. I'd like to talk about the Leafs situation before we get into talking about baseball. But first of all, just an acknowledgement of the fact that you missed a week to take care and to be with a dear friend who passed mm-hmm. away last week. Could you talk if Mina was your friend? Could you mm-hmm. talk about what made her so special? Yeah, so um, I've been in uh, the GTA, Rich, as you know. I mean, you've seen my background uh, since Easter. Um, Mina was diagnosed uh, with a very rare form of cancer um, about a year ago. The official diagnosis was in June of last year, but the problems began in April, and the imaging that was quite concerning was taking place almost exactly one year ago right now. And she went through a very, very difficult year. Uh, This is someone who never smoked anything, uh, who might have a social glass of wine uh, with dinner. Uh, She practiced yoga. She practiced mindfulness. She loved nature. uh, So she walked and she hiked a lot. Uh, She put all of us who were close to her in her life to shame, health-wise. And... Her form of cancer uh, was the result of one genetic mutation that turned into two genetic mutations, which sadly became untreatable. And uh, it was a really harrowing run for her uh, that concluded uh, last Tuesday, April the 30th at Sunnybrook Hospital. She and I had known each other since we were 11 years old. Um, We went to prom together. Oakville Trafalgar High School in June of 1998. Um, You know, I've been very open with uh, my personal life, um, my sexuality. And uh, I say this in all seriousness, just coming up with a random number. If there are 100 ways to love a woman, I love mine a 99. And unfortunately, the one way in which I could not uh, meant that we could not build a life together. And I know, uh, because she and I talked about it, that I'm not speaking out of turn uh, when I when I say what I just said. Uh, that the one thing holding us back was uh, the fact that I just could not uh, love her um, in in a way that would have permitted us to to be married. Uh, So in many ways, in almost all ways, uh, she's the love of my life and my soulmate, and now she's gone. And it was a very hard thing to be a part of, uh, but at the very same time, um, I'm grateful that she included me in her journey of the last year and uh, just an incredible person, Uh, brilliant and and not just IQ brilliant, emotionally brilliant. So EIQ brilliant, um, generous. Someone who could have taken her mind and her brain and accrued a lot of wealth for herself due to her intelligence and her ability to connect with others. But someone who devoted her professional life to nonprofits starting at Goodwill in the 2000s, spending more than a decade at Girl Guides through most of the 2010s, 
and then moving to Casey House, which is Canada's only HIV AIDS hospital uh, in 2020. And because HIV AIDS is much more treatable now than it used to be, uh, well, it is still Casey House and HIV AIDS hospital. It is also heavily involved in safe supply and in helping uh, members of our community who struggle with significant addictions to uh, narcotics and other things. Um, and that was mine as passion, uh, public policy uh, in the nonprofit uh, world. And she gave of herself, she shared of herself. And, you know, I have heard from more than one person who didn't know Mina personally, but kind of knew Mina through me because of things I would share or describe, who saw the photo of her that was posted on Facebook by her brother-in-law who announced her passing and said, that smile and those eyes literally radiate through the screen. It isn't just a regular smile. It isn't just a regular you know, set of eyes. We all have them. Um, and I said, I said to those people who said that to me, that's her. Um, she had an unbelievable and uncanny ability to make you feel like you had long been friends with her, even if she'd just met you. Um, she was wise. Uh, one of the few people, as I say, who had license in my life to say anything to me. Um, because I always knew it was coming from the right place, and I always knew it had good intent, and I, I strongly considered and often employed uh, the advice that she would give me uh, throughout our our connection together. So, you know, if you're listening to this, I'm assuming there's a 99.8 or 99.9 percent .9 chance uh, you didn't know. Mina or even know of Mina, but as I wrote on my Facebook page, you can't take Mina's kindness out of this world and say we're not meaner. You can't take Mina's brilliance out of this world and say we're not dumber. And you can't take Mina's light out of this world and say we're not dimmer. Uh, she was a truly unique and brilliant and beautiful person. And I love her and I miss her. And this is a Toronto Blue Jays themed podcast. She was also a diehard Blue Jays fan and had been her whole life. Um, so the Jays are down a big fan today, too. Scotty, I'm sure I speak for all our listeners in offering sincere condolences to you and to Mina's family. Um, I lost my brother when he was 35, my brother Pat. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I think of him every day. And it's always great thoughts, good thoughts that make me smile. So reach that point mm. and, uh, and it'll be a, a great memory that you'll have the rest of your life. Very special person. And, um, thank you. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll move and forward here and charge ahead. And, uh, uh, we know that she, uh, she's watching and, uh, Mina, I'm just looking up in the sky right now. Could you pull some levers? Uh, this Blue Jays team could use uh, could use a change of fortune, um, and that'll give us the opportunity, Griff, to pivot. So I just I just again, um, it was a very sad week. Um, Mina passed last Tuesday, and uh, there was obviously uh, some challenging days leading up to her passing. So I just want to acknowledge to you, the listener, uh, that I am coming at some of what we're talking about today uh, a little more naked uh, than I usually am. I have not been watching a lot of Blue Jays baseball in the last nine or 10 days, and um, I know what's gone on, and I read the box scores and have watched the highlights, but I have, I have just it's just not been possible for me to be as plugged in. So if you notice that Griff is carrying a lot more of the detail and I'm being more of the Larry King and asking a lot of the questions and letting Griff fill in all the blanks. Uh, hopefully in the next few weeks, uh, that'll begin to balance itself back out. But that's, that's just where it's got to be today. Cause I'm, 
I just was not able to sit down and watch a lot of Jays baseball, obviously, in the last little while. Before we get into, th thanks, Scotty, and, and before we get into uh, Blue Jays, I just want to talk about the the wrap-up of the Leafs' loss in Game 7 to the Boston Bruins, which is becoming uh, a tradition at Scotiabank and, and in Boston at Fleet Center, whatever it's called. But just, I mean, there is a comparison in... Toronto sports with the with the Leafs and the Blue Jays inability under their current GM and we'll get into the GM and the president of the Leafs Ross Atkins and Brendan Shanahan they've been around for approximately the same time but there were just some details in that Leafs game I mean they have to make changes we talk all the time about the off season for the Blue Jays and what changes they had to make they didn't make they undermade in terms of adding personnel. Um, but to me, watching that game seven and watching Mitch Marner not follow Pasternak in from the blue line, allowing him to pick up the, the puck off the boards that was thrown in by Lindholm on a, obviously a set play. Where are all their analytics people who may have spotted that uh, during this regular season and, and warned the players that look for this, especially two minutes into overtime. And and for those who criticize uh, Samsonov for not coming out to play the puck, where was Morgan Riley? That's Morgan Riley's puck to play, coming off the end boards uh, at the angle that brings the puck right out in front of the net with Mitch Marner all of a sudden realizing, uh-oh, I lost Pasternak. He's only their best player. He's only one of the top five players in the NHL what is going on and, and for leaf fans i'm sure that those are a lot of the questions and, and in this off season which is the summer for the nhl to me they've got to get mitch marner trade him because he's a hell of a player he's a great player trade him for a tier top tier defenseman who can quarterback the power play and combine i was impressed with uh McCabe, Dubois, and Edmondson on defense. So you add a player for Mitch Marner, you add a defenseman for Mitch Marner, you have Wall and, you know, another goaltender. And you let, I mean, some of these forwards too, Nyes. Big fan of Nyes, yeah. Yeah. And there were some good-looking forwards, and they've got the kid uh, who played in the A this year who's going to be coming up. So I don't think they would miss Mar Marner. They had trouble fitting him in on a line. They had, yeah, they have Easton Cowan who scored yeah, a billion points and yeah. was the OHL player of the year. Yeah. But they, they just have enough. They need to make some changes the way that everyone was speaking about the blue Jays needing to make changes in the off season. And the blue Jays changes were underwhelming. The Leafs can't afford to be underwhelming this off season. Yeah, and I mean, who knows how it's it's going to play out, Griff. The the Leaf situation at the top is interesting in that Brad Tree Living has been the general manager for essentially a calendar year now, right? Because Dubas uh, was relieved of his duties in May of last, early May of last year, and, and then Tree Living was hired. So I almost separate him from this in that regard, except that it's impossible to separate him because if there's a change above him, what does that mean for him? So Keith Pelly is the new CEO of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. So he comes in knowing a lot of the players. I mean, he is, uh, Keith Pelly is as well-connected a person in, in this city as anybody. And we know that despite the fact that he's been in Europe <laughs> for the last half decade, right? So so he's familiar with the Rogers mold and the Bell mode due to his days at TSN and then later at Sportsnet. He's connected uh, to and with everyone. And does he come in this early in his tenure, because he's only been in, in the position for a little more than a month now, and say, after a decade, Brendan Shanahan, the so-called Shanna plan, it didn't work. Uh, didn't mean that you didn't produce a lot of upper end talent because it did, right? Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, William Nylander, uh, Morgan Riley's been a good player for this team. 
Uh, they went they got John Tavares. That's a contract, sadly, that has handcuffed them. Um, but John Tavares, a good guy, local guy, wanted to come home, has worn the sea with dignity. Um, but it just hadn't worked. And they decided to run it back with the core group. They were always sprinkling around the edges. And I, I'm sure that Brendan Shanahan and others would tell you, look, we got endless money to spend in a salary capped league. And we couldn't have predicted like nobody else could have predicted that a, that a pandemic would come in, have the effect it did on the National Hockey League, which is a more gate driven league, right? It is a hard, it has the hardest cap of the major four North American professional sports. And it is most reliant of the four North American professional sports on ticket sales and gate. And when you have empty arenas for an entire year, that obviously resulted in a frozen cap. It resulted in uh, increased escrow of players' salaries for a period of time. And the Maple Leafs went from having $44 million committed to four players in a in a cap environment of about $80, $81 million, thinking that it would be up to $88, $90, $92 million two or three years later, to being stuck with a $44 million tag for four players in a cap environment that didn't increase for two or three years. And I think that that handcuffed them. It kind of snuffed out their plans and they were left to sprinkle around and change the edges, uh, uh, the margins of the roster with guys who make like 800,000 to $1.2 million. And those guys are interchangeable and they go elsewhere for raises. If they have a good year in Toronto and blah, 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 it, it, it's time to reassess this entire thing it 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 really is matthews is here and needs to be best player to ever put on a maple leafs uniform william nylander is here signed for eight years and needs to be as a result of that contract i think the first thing you do as the dust settles here is you approach john Tavares one year left on his deal and mitch marner one year left on his deal and stop handing out these bloody no movement clauses like they're goddamned candy enough because it handcuffs it. You, you're paying Mitch Marner $11 million a year pretty much. Why does he need a no-movement clause? Really? You know, so now you're handcuffed. But you need to approach those two players with no moves and see if you can't get them to agree. Um, and they may give us a list, 6, 10, 12, whatever, destinations that you're willing to go to so that we can be proactive about engaging those teams ASAP. Yeah, you point out about Keith Pelly coming in and taking over. Um, he was in Europe. He was running the uh, what was then the European Golf Tour yeah. and turned it into the DP World Tour. So uh, I'm sure he was, well, we know he was keeping an eye on what was going on in, in the NHL and, and in North American sports. And um, it doesn't necessarily, and, and to compare it to the Blue Jays situation, not everyone in front office is tied together like Sheldon Keefe wouldn't be tied together with uh, with the new GM, which I believe that they'll keep Treleving and and uh, Shanahan would be the the one because he's had what ten years at the helm, yeah, ten years, yeah, ten years at the helm, and it's similar to a guy at the Blue Jays who's had nine years, and and you can't and we've made this point before, you can't link, um. Ross Atkins and Mark Shapiro together because they came in together. Uh, Shapiro has done his job. He built that PDC in, in Florida. Uh, he was in charge of the renovations after they had explored building a new stadium completely uh, in downtown Toronto. But then they spent $360 million on a new facility on renovations of the old facility of the Rogers center, which they had owned at some sweetheart deal when it was sky dome. Um, but the guy Ross Atkins, that's a different situation. His job was to put a winner on the field to get the team deep into October. Um, he inherited some pretty damn good players uh, in 2015, 16, um, and, and now has a problem with, with, uh, Bo Bichette and Vlad, who to me are, Vlad is like 
Austin Matthews and Bo is like Mitch Marner and George Springer is like John Tavares. You've got these three guys. They're all supposed to be doing uh, certain things. Vlad has the potential to, to give you an Austin Matthews type contribution. It hasn't done it. Uh, Bo and Mitch Marner, are the, they're always the number two guys on that roster. And then the captain, the, the guy who comes in with veteran leadership and is expected to help turn the clubhouse, the locker room, the dugout, the bench around, and it hasn't happened. Um, in terms of Ross Atkins, we've discussed it before, but do you believe that it's his time has come also? Okay, so when I when I set this up, Griff, and you and I green roomed this off the air because I wanted to confirm for you that I hadn't spoken about this on the podcast before because you know my brain's kind of scrambled after the last little bit and I also gripe about this stuff to people in my life so I can't remember what I've actually said with a microphone in front of my face <laughs> and what I haven't um I don't spend a lot of time as I've discussed on social media anymore I've es essentially wiped X from my life but I am occasionally on Facebook and I do occasionally comment in some of the fan pages uh, that I follow. And so I see posts and one thing that has struck me. And again, I'm always careful to not assume that an entire fan base believes something because someone posted something on a social media platform. That's a shrewd. That's a shrewd way of thinking. Yes. But I but I do but I do believe there is for some at least a theme. And it gets to the heart of the fact that this team just isn't hitting or scoring much right now. And I know they scored eight runs yesterday, wasn't enough to win in an eleven to eight loss, but, but generally speaking, they haven't scored a lot of runs. That's not a surprise to you or me, Griff, and and most people who follow this team closely and who understand the game. This was a lineup that was going to struggle. I don't think we could have predicted that Bo and Vlad and George Springer would not be um, anywhere near up to snuff this deep into the season, but that is an added complication. Getting back to my original point with the setup that I just offered. There are a lot of people commenting about Don Mattingly and about Guillermo Martinez and about coaches and what must be a lack of preparation because of the lack of results of this lineup and while i don't believe that ross atkins set this up because that would be too shrewd and quite frankly beyond his level of intelligence to set it up this way what has been an unintentional result of that, at least in some corners of social media, is that all of the reassignments of the coaching staff, all of the title changes of a lot of the members of the coaching staff in the offseason, combined with Atkins's comments about, and I'm paraphrasing here because he didn't say this directly, but essentially insinuating that the roster is good enough, but that the way our game plans and our data were communicated to players was not good enough has now led some in the fan base, I think, to believe that it's the coach's fault because we've been told the roster's good enough and what needed to change was the way that game day planning and and scouting reports and data were communicated to players and were not getting results again this year. And in fact, they might even be worse. So there needs there must be a flaw in that element of what the Jays are doing. So it must be Don Mattingly's fault. Well, my response would be, how could it possibly be Don Mattingly's fault? Well, did you see Don Mattingly's results as L.A. Dodgers manager? Yeah, I did. He went to the playoffs every year. Yeah, but they didn't win anything. Well, neither has Dave Roberts in a 162-game season. And oh, by the way, when Don Mattingly was the manager of the LA Dodgers, he had Clayton Kershaw and Kenley Jansen and nobody to get from Kershaw to Jansen. So he would leave Kershaw out for too long in playoff games because he didn't trust Pedro Baez or Joe Bimel. 
and and they would lose those games in the seventh inning because Kershaw fell apart and the Dodgers would go on and lose playoff series. That's not Mattingly being an idiot. That was a personnel problem from higher up. Then Don Mattingly goes and manages the Miami Marlins for seven seasons. What are the Miami Marlins? Go and get a dictionary. Or alternatively, find a dictionary online and type in the word dysfunction. If there isn't a Marlins logo next to the word dysfunction, then the dictionary's doing it wrong. That's not on Don Mattingly. Don Mattingly was one of the best hitters of his generation and is prepared as a coach to help players succeed. It is not on Don Mattingly's preparation, and it is not on the way Don Mattingly at all are communicating said information to the players. This team has a personnel problem. So if you want to take a dump on John Schneider, fine. You want to take a dump on Don Mattingly, fine. You want to call for John Schneider's head on May the 6th, go right ahead. But I am here to tell you that there is not a soul on the Toronto Blue Jays coaching staff, regardless of title, who should be fired before the general manager. And if the general manager is fired and that general manager's replacement wants to make changes to the uniformed staff, that will be that person's prerogative. But enough, enough with the shiny object distractions of the manager and the coaching staff. And there are reasons to question some things that John Schneider has decided upon in game. There's no doubt about that. But who put him in that role? Year nine, it's not good enough. We're tired of it. We're tired of the act, the corporatist bullshit, the robotic, inhumane uh, stuff we get. I've been on it for too long. I'm back on it now. You've caught me in a period of agitation. Rant over. Griff, over to you. Yeah, well, you look at uh, you look at the Blue Jays offense, and and to me, there's a consistency between last year and this year. And we talked at spring training about how Don Mattingly would would bring a new level of preparedness uh, instead of looking at what pitchers had done previously to get them out, and then going into a game and having them change. Uh, the way they approach the Blue Jays hitters early and then having them catch up again. So basically the point was that Mattingly would help make the adjustments in time to start a game and produce some early offense. That didn't happen. I I, I watch games on TV and the broadcasters and, and Shulman and Buck Martinez or Shulman and, uh, and Joe Siddle, they're talking about Pre-game, they, they take the other starting pitcher and say he throws 51% four-seam fastballs. And then the game will start, and he'll throw 28% four-seam fastballs. And, and the booth will sound surprised. It's one thing for the booth to sound surprised, but for the dugout to sound surprised. And they always look surprised when they get beat by the other pitches in the pitcher's repertoire early that shouldn't be happening. Now, that's the thing that has to be corrected. And it's not a matter of of mechanics and hitting technique and whatever. And, and I believe that Don Mattingly would be able to help solve that problem. But it's still a problem with the same hitters and the same players in the dugout offensively. In fact, a level below on the surface, what the Blue Jays had in 2023. And you look at free agents that were available, Marcelo Zuna leading the National League in RBIs or right up there. Um, He was a free agent and the Blue Jays were said to be interested. Then you had J.D. Martinez. You You have players that were available and instead the Blue Jays under Ross Atkins continued to stress run prevention and looking for defenders, looking for IKF, who was a former gold glove defender, but not really an offensive threat. He was replacing Whit Merrifield, who might have been more of an offensive threat than IKF, uh, but who knows? And then it's a belt that we, neither of us cared for as a DH. But then they bring in uh, Daniel Vogelback for the moment. Daniel Vogelback couldn't even hit the other day 
I think it was Sunday. They were tied 8-8. And Daniel Vogelbach was in the in the dugout of Ville with runners on first and third with one out in an 8-8 game. And instead of Vogelbach hitting, and the Nationals have no left-handers to bring in to face Vogelbach to nullify him, instead of him being sent to the plate first and third, 8-8 game in the seventh, they tried a uh, safety squeeze with Ernie Clement, who popped the ball in the air and it fell in front of the first baseman. And Danny Jansen had to hesitate at third. And then he came home and, and was trying to swim home like Mark Spitz on dry land. And, and he was tagged out easily. And, and yet Vogelback was still in the dugout and they grabbed a bat in the ninth inning in case the tying run was coming to the plate, which would have been him, but it never got that far. And so like the offense is still a problem. The personnel that was given to John Schneider is a notch below 2023, which was also a disappointing offensive season, but run prevention seems to be fine. And the starting staff is fine. And, and that's, on the GM, as far as I'm concerned, the president, Mark Shapiro, has done his thing, but you can't, they're not attached at the hip, and one of them can go and the other can stay, and the guy that I think has to go at some point would be Ross. Yeah, I don't think he has to go. I know he has to go. It, it It's time, and, and yeah. You know. James Click is in the organization, and he was the general manager of the world champion Astros. And, I mean, he's kind of like Ben Sherrington was before Sherrington left for Pittsburgh, right? You, you had a guy more accomplished underneath Ross Atkins, but there was just no upward mobility. And I, I think there was some talk at the time that you know, Sherrington at that point in his life didn't necessarily want to be a general manager, obviously ended up taking the, the the Pittsburgh job. Sometimes you can have kids at certain ages and you, you know, you want to be home a little more. You want to be able to be available a little more to your family. That That's totally understandable. And maybe Sherrington was still sort of cleaning himself off from the experience in Boston, because even if you win World Series with the Red Sox, it's it's a it's a grind. It's a it's an intense experience. And I just wonder if 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 Click is the next guy, um, if it's going to be an in season move, Griff. It Whoa. would have to be Click, in my opinion. A because he's got the resume, and B because you would want somebody who's already in the organization. I mean, you're not bringing a guy in in June or July, and then putting him in charge of the trade deadline when he's not familiar. Uh, front to back with your organization. Um, otherwise, to me, you're waiting until the end of the season. And and it's it's the general manager and it's probably some uniformed coaching staff because somebody else would come in and want to put their people in place. Yeah, if, if it's in season, it's definitely going to be click. There's no doubt about that. And there, there's another thing to think about is uh, for a couple of years now, people have been talking and we've talked about in the off season is uh, whether they're going to be able to sign. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Bo Bichette to long-term deals. And to me, looking at the Blue Jays situation and looking at Ross Atkins, if I was representing either Bo or Vlad, I wouldn't want to begin a negotiation right now until I know where this organization is heading. And we, we've already we've also talked about the fact that this organization cannot, and I hear it on MLB Network and you read it on The Athletic, about becoming sellers at the deadline. This Blue Jays organization with the with the renovations that they've put in at the Rogers Center and the amount of money they've spent in order to generate more money with fewer seats, they cannot become sellers, true sellers at the deadline. They can't. They can't throw in the towel with three months left in the season because you'll be able, able to fire a cannon through those those private clubs when they open up mid season and not hit anybody. And uh, so I think that if they are going to make an in season move with the GM, that 
it will be clicked. There's no doubt about that. He's familiar with the organization, familiar with players, familiar with the agents that represent the best players on this Blue Jays team. So it makes all the sense in the world, not only that click is the one, but that it happened in season. As you said before the deadline. Yeah. And, and here's the, and we've, we've discussed this topic before at different times during our, our podcasts life. And I think it's relevant again with the additional context of the first month of this season. Griff, there is no way that the Blue Jays would offer Vladimir Guerrero Jr. a contract that both in terms and dollar, I think he would legitimately entertain at this particular point. I, I don't I don't see where the happy medium is between a player who is better than he is performing right now, and we believe, and goodness hopes we're right, um, is a better player than he has been for the last year and a bit now. And maybe you even want to stretch that back into some of 2022. And the same may be true for Bo Bichette, although if you accept who Bo is as a player, not going to take walks, going to be a lot of 0-2 counts before you, 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 know, you blink, you, you reach for the remote, um, you, you turn and say something to somebody in the room, and it's, it's 0-2 by the time you've turned your head back. If you accept that, okay, um, he is kind of who he is. But what do you, how do you assess? Like you and I can sit here and say, well, Boba Shet's who Boba Shet is. If I'm the Toronto Blue Jays, I'm looking at the totality of it. He was very good last year. He has improved through hard work defensively. But I am, I mean, I'm in charge of an organization. And I am also concerned about employment preservation. And that involves making the right decisions and allocating proper resources. I would be keenly aware that that 2022 season and the numbers that Bo ended up with were the result of his final six weeks. The first four, four and a half months of that season, he had a sub 300 on base percentage and was left in the two hole for far too long. So, you know, the final numbers were good. And the hit total was where you'd expect it to be because Bo's a 200-hit-a-year guy. But what I can't really get around, and I don't have an answer to it, so it's a good thing I'm not being paid to run the Toronto Blue Jays, is where is the happy medium right now for either Vladimir Guerrero Jr. or Bo Bichette's contracts? Because I just don't think the Blue Jays would be willing to offer term and dollar to either that would satisfy either. And I don't think either is worth the contract that they want at this particular point. Yeah. Before we wrap up this portion of the discussion, but this portion of the podcast, I've been saying for a long time that uh, any championship team that is going to be sustainable needs to build, start with two homegrown guys among their position players and the two homegrown guys, the only two that stand out for the blue Jays right now are Bo and Vlad. So we're, that's been my reasoning for locking them up. You don't want a team, you don't want a dugout of 13 mercenaries uh, as position players. You need two homegrowns to sort of lead the way. Um, and that would be Bo and Vlad. The follow-up to that is that at this point in the history of baseball and the finances of baseball, this past off season was so puzzling. Do you go with a Fernando, like as a, as a player, as a representative of Bo Bichette or Vlad Guerrero Jr., do you go with a Fernando Tatis type contract or do you try and, or do you look and say, well, look at last year, everything was short term with opt outs after a year, three years opt outs. Where is baseball going to land in this situation? I think, it will be a hybrid with uh, no longer the 12 to 14 because it's become 12 to 14 years becoming a young man's game. You look at 
young players in the minor leagues, they're being brought up earlier than ever. And I think that's a good thing because that's a way to attract better athletes to major league baseball is you can't send them to the minor leagues for five years like they did in the past because the best athletes are going to go to the NBA or going to go to the NFL. But if you can compete and say after one season in the minor leagues and not even going to Bluefield or Asheville or anywhere like that, but you go to the development league development complex league where you have first class facilities. And then next year we'll give you a legitimate shot at making the major league roster and we will live with your stupid errors because you haven't played enough of the game. You don't have your 5,000 or 3,000 at bats or whatever it was acceptable in the past in the minor leagues. You don't have that, but we will live with that because you are the future of this game. You are the best athletes in the organization and, and we need to, uh, support and steal from other sports. And I, I think that that's the change you're seeing. You're not going to see the long-term deals for Bo and Vlad, but I don't think you'll see the what we saw last winter with three years with opt-out, opt-out, opt-out. I don't think you'll see that. So it won't happen this year. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't change your GM. <laughs> that's, that was where this discussion began. But I do think that uh, even with a year left after this season for both Bo and Vlad, that they should seriously consider uh, locking them up to whatever the structure becomes in terms of uh, how to how to keep those players in the organization in terms of uh, term and, and length. Let's pivot to Alec Manoa. And... So again, uh, as I cop to off the top, been a uh, just really difficult and different kind of week in my life. So didn't have a lot of opportunity to watch Manoa pitch yesterday as we sit here on Monday, May the 6th. First three innings, pretty good. And then the fourth, it, it just all fell apart. Naturally, when you watch the highlight shows, you see a lot of the damage done against Alec. And, and I saw fastballs in the middle of the plate at 93 miles an hour, I saw sliders that really fell into the bat path of left-handed hitters, and the Nationals were able to do a lot of damage in the fourth inning. You saw the game, Griff, and so you have much better context, and you are about to pitch me, to sell me, on why, even though the final line didn't look good and resembled most of the box scores that Manoa posted at AAA in his buildup to his first start in the bigs this season. It's a better result in totality than any of the results he had last year. Yeah, the the uh, the Alec Manoa that we saw on Sunday was so different, so far different than the Alec Manoa of a year ago, where when he was sent to the minor leagues, he didn't report right away when he, when he, uh, and then didn't pitch again the rest of the year where originally he was sent down and he went to the, to the uh, PDC, to the complex league, which is as low as you can be sent. And so it was a, a difficult season for Alec Manoa as a young man, 25 year old last year, 26 years old this year. And I got to confess that I'm a big Alec Manoa fan as a person. I was his PR guy when he was a rookie. Um, I tried to take care of him in terms of of, of t telling him what I thought he should do. Uh, he was always responsive and, and would look you right in the eye as you talk to him. Uh, a legit guy with a chance to be a star player in baseball and and he loved what he was doing he loved being with the blue jays he loved being in the major leagues he loved his path to get to the major leagues and what i saw on sunday was a return to 2022 in terms of body language in terms of stuff in terms of staying within himself staying under control Early in the game, like in the fourth inning, the part that you saw highlights, that was not the slider that he was displaying early in the game and in Buffalo. When you see the Buffalo highlights and then watch the first two or three innings of the game at in D.C., that was a slider that was going 
from one o'clock arm slot to about seven. So it wasn't 12 to six, the classic over the top curveball, but it, it had more break than he had at any time um, in 2023. And so was it Griff? Was it like 2021 when he came up in 2022 when he would just wipe right handed hitters out because that thing would almost go sideways on them sometimes? Absolutely. And and like his velocity, 94, 95, he was he was hitting corners. The first play of the game didn't help him out. It made it, you know, he threw a lot of extra pitches. It was a ground ball to short, and Bo came underneath the throw and pulled Vlad off the bag. And and he fought out of that. He walked a couple of guys he threw too many extra pitches because of that. Uh, and the same spot in the order, the same two guys in the middle of the order, he went three walks and a hit by pitch. And so he's got a lot to work on. There's no doubt, but the body language after he came out of that game, he stayed in the dugout and he, his eyes didn't look vacant. He didn't look like he was thinking about something else or feeling sorry for himself. He was, fist bumping his teammates who had played behind him in the field. And he stayed in the dugout and he had a little bit of a smirky smile on his face. Like he was thrilled to be there, thrilled at most of his performance and understanding that he's going to get another shot. He is going to stay in the rotation. And we talked about it off air that it might be, what did we say next weekend against the twins? Yeah, well, they got the two when off days, right? Home. Yeah, Tuesday and uh, yeah, sorry, so it'll probably be Sunday and Sunday. Thursday. But probably if they stay on turn, Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, yeah. So he knows that he's going to have that opportunity again. He's he sees what I saw in terms of uh, Buffalo, his last start there, and the first major league start. That there's so much that was better. And yet the highlight packages will only show the the fourth inning where he gave up, he got tonged here and 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 gave up a, a line drive double or whatever. But I see a lot from a kid that I have, you know, a kid, he's 26 years old, but everyone's a kid to me. So um that he just knows his own potential, knows that he can get back to that. And if he does, I don't think it was a panic move in terms of when they put Yariel Rodriguez on the IL. I think they put Yariel Rodriguez on the IL with the uh, famous back issue. You know, oh, man, back, issues, back issues are tough to uh, to judge. But they know they've only got a certain number of pitches and innings out of Yariel. Well, and Griff, you but also... You, sliding you him later into the season and saving those pitches and yeah. innings because they know that they wanted to give Alec Manoa a shot. I mean, they they made that move even before Manoa started in Buffalo where he struck out 12 and in six innings. So they knew they were going to do that, but it's not like a panicky move. We need to bring him up. That was the plan. They're going to give him a, a chance to become the Alec Manoa of years past. And I think it, it's a good gamble. He's a good kid, and uh, I hope that I hope it works out for him. But it, it, that definitely wasn't a panic move to put him in the fifth spot in the rotation because that was going into spring training what they wanted to do in the first place. Well, with and with Yariel, it's not like demoting him to Buffalo serves any purpose because if you're managing his innings, there needs to be periods of time when he's not pitching. So he's not he's not going to Buffalo to start every five days and throw three or four innings in a game, right? Because that just accumulates mileage and they're trying to manage that. I think what an IL stint can do is you can say, oh, the back's tweaked just a little bit. And God, I, I can I can speak to this. Um, you know, I've had back problems. You you can invent a back problem and you can do almost nothing and have a serious back problem for a while. So the degree to which it's real is isn't relevant but what right. what an IL an IL stint allows you to do is you send him down to the complex in Florida and then you have him in the lab and he'll yeah. throw he, sides and he'll and he'll you know he'll have a workout routine and a regimen the arm will stay in shape the body will stay in shape that's the plan and when you put him on a rehab option he's got 30 days so that means uh, when he's when they project ahead to when they want him to re-enter the rotation, they backdate that 30 days. They put him down in Buffalo. He starts pitching in games. 
and so he's still got that inning and pitch total that they had projected when the season started. And the thing about Yariel Rodriguez is a guy like that has a five-year guaranteed $32 million contract. So whether he goes to Buffalo and cooperates with them and goes, yeah, yeah, my back is killing me. I'm going, I'm going down and I'm going to, he knows he's why he's down. He knows that they believe that he's only got a certain number of innings and pitches in his arm because he had taken a full year off from pro baseball. I mean, he obviously had thrown on the side in 2023, but he knows all that. And he knows that his money is guaranteed for the next five years, as opposed to, and we talked about this out there too, uh, poor Nathan Lucas, who got called up for 14 hours, didn't get in a game and then got sent down again when Kevin Kiermaier was reactivated he came lucas came up to replace addison barger who really needs work in the outfield and was struggling at the plate with great bat speed great potential but he wasn't ready obviously got his only major league hit his first major league hit good for addison but then why are you bringing nathan lucas up and which brings us back to the gm and, and the way that they operate the front office why are you bringing Nathan Lucas up for one game in Washington, D.C., and then sending him back down the next morning? And he didn't even get in the game. He wasn't planning on uh, being the starter in that game. Just makes no sense. It, it it shows, or it seems to show a lack of planning. Yeah, it, it, it brings me back to John Lott's favorite word when, we, when I use it, rosturbation, right? John will sometimes offer us feedback and say, um, what does that even mean? <laughs> I used to, uh, we coined that phrase back in Alex Anthopoulos's time when like um, a guy like Casper Wells would join the team in Kansas city for three games in April of 2013, not make an appearance. And then he's DFA'd and then the next guy's in and then there's Chris gets, and then Chris gets is gone. And I'm, I'm, I'm mixing up my years, but you follow my point. It's just like, we'll get this guy and we'll get that guy and we'll get this guy and we'll get that guy. So, so there, there's a bit of a roster Bation feel to it. My only thing is now you don't, and we can't sit here and predict a scenario in which that they, they would need Nathan Lucas, but they don't have him available Griff to come back to play for the blue Jays for a week and a half unless he returns on a an air quotes emergency basis as an emergency recall for someone who gets put on the injured list who is then lost for 10 days so yeah. you, you know like the it was a waste of like it was a waste of an option really it's like uh, uh the press box game of when you know that they're going to need when the blue jays are going to need another arm in the bullpen and because there's a stretch of games coming up or, or they've been overworked or, and then you see in the sixth inning who gets up in the bullpen and you go, uh Oh, if he goes more than one inning, there's the guy that's headed oh, yeah. up, even though there was no other reason for it. And it inevitably was that guy he'd throw five outs and then boom, after the game, he's called in the office. See ya. Do you remember in 2014 it's a heartless game? It's a heartless you do you remember the eight? Uh, God, it would it might have been nineteen innings, but it was eighteen or nineteen innings. The Jays beat the Tigers on a Sunday afternoon at the Dome with a flight to Seattle, a charter flight to Seattle to begin a series with the Mariners the next night, and the Jays won that game. And Chad Jenkins threw like six shutout innings yeah, and extra and, innings, and Gibby wouldn't send him down, right? And 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 he was on the flight to Seattle the next day. Right. And, and Jenkins was back then your consummate. And you, you remind me where, where the Bisons, the AAA affiliate by then, I feel like, yeah, I think, yeah, I believe I feel like yeah. when I covered the team, I don't ever remember saying that otherwise Jason's... he could have parachuted into Vegas on the right, way. Well, good point. Yeah, no. Cause I, I remember, yeah, I, I said, when I covered the team, I don't remember ever saying the Jays option so-and-so to Vegas. It was, yeah. So it was Buffalo. So, but like, instead of stashing Jenkins in Buffalo, even though he couldn't throw till yeah. the end of the following week, because he's essentially having just pitched like a starter, six innings, and, you know, <laughs> we're in Seattle. Like, so Jenkins is still here. Well, we couldn't exactly demote him after what he did for us yesterday, but which he, was the human way to handle it. 
Right, but you he know? was he was supposed to be the guy, but Gibby wouldn't do it. Right. Yeah. He yeah, says like the guy threw six innings for us. We're not going to send him out. And we won the ball game. You know. Yeah. You know. So yeah, but there's that's the that's a component to it. There's a there is a human element. We sometimes forget these guys are well. It wouldn't have been the bus to Toronto and the bus back to Buffalo because the Jays were in Washington. I did the math on it, Griff. If you if you if you divide the league minimum major league minimum salary by uh, 185 which are the number of days in a big league season it is about three thousand eight hundred and sixty dollars for lucas so well it would be frustrating and an annoyance and an inconvenience uh to be parachuted around the way he was and not make an appearance he comes out financially for a single day way ahead of where he would have otherwise been had he just stayed with the bisons and don't forget the meal money too he gets one yeah. or maybe two days of meal money i mean if you effort. wanted to if you wanted to pay me three thousand eight hundred and sixty dollars today to do nothing and throw on a baseball uniform and stand in the dugout i'd raise my hand to fly from indy you know? to, uh, to fly from indy to dc and back yeah sure yeah. But uh, I I would say Nathan Lucas probably has higher aspirations as a baseball player than I do, so um, I can see where for him it would be a little a little more frustrating. Yeah, let, but, I, I got I got a I think the bullpen. I got, do you want to get to the bullpen or what do you want to well, do? No, I, I was going to the catching because the Danny Jansen the return of Danny Jansen has not only been a boon to the the Blue Jays offense, but I've followed like the performance of uh, Alejandro Kirk. And I don't know whether I talked about it last week or we talked about it the week before, but his performance um, was one for, he was one for 21 catching his third or fourth day in a row, Kirk one for 21. And then since Danny Jansen's return, he hasn't had to catch two days in a row. And his performance has, has become what we expect out of Alejandro Kirk. So basically to me, the return of Danny Jansen has not only been good for Danny Jansen and good for the pitching staff, but also great for Alejandro Kirk. What's, what's your take on that? Yeah. I, I mean, my first thought is, and and I want to be very clear about this. I'm not body shaming, but in, in fact, I don't even really need to go there. The, the catching position is hard, right? It's extremely demanding. So four or five days a week, max, you've got day games that follow night games. And I know that uh, Brian Servan was either catching the night game before a day game or the day game after a night game before Jansen returned. But you really need to, you, you really need two guys you can use. And I think we're watching hockey um, and a lot of teams are like almost going to tandem goaltending now. It's there, there's no more, there's no more 65 game starters and the backup who plays 17, right? It's, it's, it's way more almost 50, 50 split. And I, I think with catching, um, and, and just to keep a guy like Alejandro Kirk, Danny Jansen too, but Alejandro Kirk in, you know, setting guys up to succeed, uh, you want to put people in the best position to succeed. I, I think that this hybrid is the, the best way to do it. It has worked for a couple of years. And I think there's a wear down effect on anybody when one of Jansen or Kirk goes down because it then requires the other to really take on a massive load because you're running Tyler Heineman out there last year or Brian Servan this year if if it isn't Kirk or Jansen. So let's just hope that Jansen stays healthy because he means so much to this team. It isn't just the threat of the home run when he's in the batter's box or his ability to handle the pitching staff and 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 his defensive game, he's in many ways the spirit of the team, the soul of the group. 
And so he's important in all of those ways as well. But I, yeah, I, I think the tandem catching Griff is sort of the way things should be for all teams now, if, if, if they, if, if you can swing it. Yeah. Here's an interesting factor to consider with these two guys with Jansen and Kirk is that remember when Dalton Varsho was acquired, the Jays took great pains to mention that he was a catcher that he had caught in the major leagues and the reason for that was because there was a thinking that with Kirk's bat, and it had been so good at one point, that he could DH more. They re didn't really have a DH per se at that time, but that Kirk could catch or could DH. And then if if something happened to Jansen or if he was injured, you wouldn't have to bring Kirk in to catch from his DH position that you could have Varsho catch a couple innings. Now that's gone by the boards, but it's flipped completely because I, if I was managing this Jays team would not hesitate to have Danny Jansen DH certain games against left-handers, maybe even against some right-handers because of the way he's swinging the bat now. And because the, it lengthens the batting order and, and they've struggled to score runs at many, many times. So like now they've got IKF who's also caught in the big leagues and Varsho who's also caught in the big leagues. So it's flipped around and, and Kirk is the guy who's going to be in every, uh, every second day or uh, one out of three starting catcher and isn't going to DH because he just, his bat has not, responded the way it used to and and so jansen has now become the more important catcher and he's a free agent at the end of the year so they better think about something uh to to bring him back because there's nobody in their minor league system that's threatening right now yeah if jansen and kirk can't go and you don't want to bring servant up what is it like an arm wrestling match between varsho and kiner falefa and the loser has to catch that day or that would, that would uh, i think Peyton Henry is the guy that at spring training was sort of competing with Brian Servin. But yeah. I like that Phil Clark who caught at Vanderbilt. He's perpetually forever at double A, but like he's a catcher. He's got some ability to swing the bat. And I think people forget about him and he might be on the, on the uh, depth chart, not moving up for any reason other than people are moonwalking back past him. But Nevertheless, David Price, David Price's Vanderbilt University, the uh, the Harvard of the SEC. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the Harvard. Don't tell you that of the SEC. Uh, let's get to the bullpen here, Griff, because we're we're down to our, our final minutes of this episode. Uh, I'll let you run with this. I, I mean, there are enough quality arms down there that you presume it's going to get organized but we're more than a month into the season and it's not organized. I think there's a lot of grace and should be for Eric Swanson's performance because of the near tragedy he experienced in spring training. And then he gets back throwing and then the arm stiffens up and he begins the year on the injured list. And now he's back and he's not performing to the level that they need him to. So, well, I can be okay with Swanson's performance, understanding the circumstance can't be thrown in leverage at this point. Can't no, be. Absolutely. Not until he gets going. I don't think that uh, Eric Swanson in his two appearances in Washington was able to throw uh, consecutive splitters below the belt. Everything was hanging middle of the plate. Um, but again, he had such an unfortunate incident, accident at spring training. And so we'll cut him some slack there. But I remember talking to, I remember asking John Schneider, how does it feel? This was my question. How does it feel having two sets of relievers that you can go three straight games and not worry about covering the sixth to the ninth inning because you're so deep down there in the pen. And then all of a sudden, Chad Green's no longer there. I mean, he's coming back, but he he's not there right now. Jimmy Garcia with that uh, bad back. Um, and, and honestly, I don't know if it's not serious. Okay, he should be back for the Philly series. If it is more serious than they thought, they should have had somebody up uh, for the 
Washington for the national series because they were so short in the bullpen. I mean, when you're bringing Nate Pearson out three out of four games or whatever it was, and Nate's struggling to be consistent. Um, Eric Swanson's not even struggling to be consistent. He's just perpetually inconsistent at this point, a three run Homer, two run Homer. Um, it's tough to put him out there in leverage. Then no Bowden Francis or Bowden Francis would be up there as an innings eater, as a guy that could pitch two or three innings because they didn't like him as a starter, but they love him in that role and he's not available. So Pearson made Tim Mazes struggling a little bit. He's not, hasn't got the effectiveness so far that he's had in previous years. They're expecting him to get back. And if, if you can't carry the game from the starter to the ninth inning, then Romano doesn't get in games either. And they haven't been able to do that. If they've, they blew a three, one and a six, one lead in DC. And if you can't rely on your bullpen to do that, your closer is useless and everyone in the middle is struggling. So like your starting rotation is really good. And, and if, uh, if Alec Manoa can step it up and sort of join that group at a, a definite four or five level in the rotation, all you need is green back Swanson finding his groove. Um, Jimmy Garcia back. Jimmy Garcia has been outstanding. He's had closer stuff. And then Romano will become a factor. But until then, we're seeing what we see. And uh, it's it's ugly to watch. We'll leave it there and hope that the Jays can begin to turn a corner with the Philly series. Two games coming up Tuesday, Wednesday, another off day. Uh, today, as we sit here, Monday, May the 6th is an off day. Another off day Thursday, the Minnesota Twins coming in to kick off the next homestand for three games on Friday. Uh, life is going to sort of resume some normalcy for me. Um, and so I thank you, uh, Griff, for your patience because we have rescheduled this podcast and re recorded it on some Tuesdays in the last month. And I know you were alone last week because I had to... Um, uh, step aside and we have obviously talked a lot about doing live post game shows after selected blue jays games i think that that is going to come into play now um i will be back in the maritimes this time next week we'll be i'll be recording if all goes according to plan uh from halifax next monday with you and as i get settled back in you and i'll talk and we'll do some live youtube post game shows at youtube.com slash exit philosophy we'll make sure you know what those dates are well in advance uh, so that you can lock in join us in the comments section uh, please uh, subscribe uh, please tell a friend about the exit philosophy podcast uh, give us a rating at youtube.com slash exit philosophy please subscribe please like uh, please make comments and uh, we'll do our best to respond. And griffsthepitch.com. Griffsthepitch.com is where you can get all of Griff's written work, the Exit Philosophy podcast, and interviews that he has done uh, with current former Blue Jays and former Montreal Expos. Uh, so Phillies, twins on the docket, Exit Philosophy to return next Monday. Some live YouTube postgame shows to follow as we get deeper into May and June. Otherwise, have a wonderful week. Thanks, Scotty, and condolences again from all our listeners and from myself and my family. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.